The perennial wisdom, known by various names such as the ageless wisdom, the tradition, esoteric knowledge, and modern esotericism has always been a part, a crucial part, of human history. It is like a golden thread woven through the fabric of time, linking different epochs and civilizations. Master Omram Mikhail Eifenhoff eloquently described it as the initiatic science or the sacred science of the initiates. Hi, I am Naika and I will be your host for this new show towards a solar civilization, the teaching of Omram Mikhail Eifenhoff. Today, I am pleased to present to you Carmen Froment. Born in Quebec and raised Catholic, Carmen's curiosity led her from singing about God as a child to exploring reincarnation as a teen. She became a flight attendant at 19, trained as a yoga teacher in the United States, and continued her spiritual journey throughout her life. She discovered Omram's teaching in her early 20s and met him while in her late 20s, which deeply influenced the rest of her life. She also became an author and coordinator of the Aquarian team, a group writing books based on Omram Mikhail Ivanhoff's teaching. In this very first episode towards a solar civilization, Carmen will explore many topics, including the concept of the science of the initiates and how it differs from traditional science, criteria for identifying a true spiritual master, the significance of the sun in our spiritual work, various methods of self-transformation, and much, much more. Here's to you, Carmen. Thank you, Naika, for this warm introduction, and welcome to our first episode of Towards a Solar Civilization, what is the science of the initiate or initiatic science? It is a body of knowledge acquired by the great initiates and masters revealed to them by the invisible world in order to help humanity in its development. This body of knowledge was reserved only to a few and well-selected students who demonstrated a strong psyche and a disinterested nature. These students, disciples, they had to undergo very strong tests and trials to prove their worthiness. For example, it was said that in the school of Pythagoras, that students had to stay for five years on the outskirt of the school, accomplishing demeaning tasks and proving their humility and their stability before they were accepted inside the school of Pythagoras. And then in the mysteries of Egypt, it is said that disciples had to be put in a sarcophagus for three days. And there they could find out if they were worthy or not, if they survived, if they overcame their fear, or if they were able to astral travel. Those who did not succeed had to leave those sacred and secret schools, but some of them became magicians because they had some knowledge and they had some powers, but they had not attained self-mastery and they used that knowledge for their own interest. Now this body of knowledge has been known through times as the tradition, the ageless wisdom, the esoteric science or modern esotericism. Omram Mikhail Ivanov called it initiatic science. It went through Atlantis, Egypt, India, Tibet, Jerusalem, and some of these great masters who have come are Moses, Rama, Krishna, Plato, Orpheus, Buddha, Hermes Trismegistus, Pythagoras, Zarathustra, Aura Mazda, Lao Tzu, Peter Dunov, Rudolf Steiner, and more recently, Omra Mikhail Ivanov. We said that these initiates and masters had been acquiring their knowledge through the invisible world. Well, 
through their uh, inspiration, through their inner work of meditation, contemplation, identification, and also astral traveling, they were able to see the structure of the universe, go into the higher realm of the invisible world. And there they saw how everything operated. And they're also linked to this great body of souls who've been working for bettering humanity called the Universal White Brotherhood. Now, Mikhail Ivanov was clear to state that this great body of beings, although he named his movement Universal White Brotherhood, was clear to say that it was a mere office of the invisible Universal White Brotherhood and that we were just trying to be a reflection of that invisible one. Now, you may ask, what is the difference between this initiatic science and traditional science? Well, traditional science is based on a materialistic point of view. It is quantitative, qualitative, objective, and it mirrors the geocentric point of view. And it puts itself at the center of uh, their truth. Um, this concept was accepted before, but it took Copernicus to come and show that it was actually the sun that was at the center of the solar system, the heliocentric point of view that he brought. And yet he was jailed for bringing such a theory. People could not accept it. It took a hundred years before the heliocentric point of view was accepted. Nowadays, anybody would come up with such a theory, they would be called a conspiracy theorist, or it would be misinformation. In those days, it was accepted that there was a geocentric point of view. And a hundred years later, finally, the heliocentric point of view is now the model by which humanity accepts that that's how things work. Great initiates and masters have based their teaching on a heliocentric point of view, which means it has put the sun or representing, symbolizing the spirit at the center of their teaching. So in the past, golden ages have always been put on a solar system. All golden ages that have existed had a solar model and that's why it blossomed and it was so happy because it's also linked to how we are structured. We are a blueprint of that system. So when we think of these essential truths that have been brought by teachers of the past and through initiatic science, we understand that is a world that is very well organized where there are principles and laws that apply to all kingdoms, from the spiritual kingdom to the human kingdom, to the animal kingdom, vegetable kingdom, and mineral kingdom. The principles and the laws apply to everything, including the human psyche. So let's look at some of these principles. Let's start with the world of unity, God, the source or spirit. As if God polarized himself, then we have duality, the eternal masculine, eternal feminine principle. From these two principles, we can see so many more things that have that perfect correspondence, such as electricity magnetism, such as positive negative, acid and base. And when these pairs work together, they produce a third element. Now we have the Trinity, such as father, mother, and child. Electricity and uh, magnetism pr produce movement. Uh, positive, negative produce a charge. Acid and base produce a salt. So you see how everything is consistent. No surprises there. And that's it for the world of principles. There's not so many. 
But in the world of laws, there are many more. There's the law of karma or what we call action reaction, cause and consequence. The word karma nowadays means more like paying our debts or misfortunes that happen to people. It's a bit of a distortion because in fact, it's the result of the law of cause and consequence. Then we have the law of reincarnation. What we bind on earth has to be unbound on earth. Yes, it means that it's hardly possible to become perfect in one lifetime. So the soul has to come back again and again in a new set of clothing into a different gender in order to manifest and develop the qualities and virtues, but also to repair some of the faults that have been committed. So the law of reincarnation, we cannot dissolve ourselves from it. Then there's the three laws of magic, the law of affinity, likes attracts likes, or bird of a feather flock together. Yes, this law of affinity is there before us. We've said those uh, idiomatic expression before, but we have not realized that we are affected by these laws on our everyday life. And then there's the law of backlash or the law of echo, which means if you stand on a mountain, if you say, I love you, then you, you hear the echo back, I love you, I love you, I love you, and sometimes amplified. And then there's the law of recording, which means that all our thoughts, all our feelings, all our actions are recorded on the fabric of life, on this astral substance, like on a matrix. And it's recorded on the Akasha Kranika. Some people even have the ability to, to travel and go and read the Akasha Kranika. Oh, the whole story of humanity is there and of every being on the planet is there. Quite a powerful law. The law of necessity is like the animal kingdom, the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom doesn't have any freedom. It just follows the, the law of necessity. No free will are those three realms. It starts with human beings. So we enter into free will on that level. So the law of free will means we have choices. Do we always make the right choice? Not bearing the consequences. But once we awaken spiritually, we can start making better choices and we start having a little bit of freedom at that level. Then we have the law of providence where total freedom exists. Beings who are operating under the law of providence are no longer subject to karma. They are totally in free will. They live from the soul and the spirit and their divine intuition guides them. There's very few people who live at that level, but that's where we are aiming. That's what we are calling for. So these are some of the laws that we operate through. Then there's the world of manifestations or methods. This is the world of diversification of variety. And with the teaching of Amra Mikhail Ivanov, we find methods that are adapted for our present life. In the past, each teacher, each master that came along spoke in a language that could be understood by those being of that era. So they spoke with uh, legends, epics, parable, symbols. Amra Mikhail Ivanov uses uh, images. He likes to take images in the living in the living book of nature to explain some of these great laws and principles. It was um, Robert uh, Rudolf Steiner who, in 1900, said, "The one who comes after me will have such a simple language that even children will be able to understand him." And it will be the Mikhailic era. Well, I believe we are now into that Mikhailic era 
we have a simple language, we have images to help us understand how the invisible world operates and how we can make our life on the model of that heliocentric point of view where we put spirit at the center of our life. We are at the threshold of tremendous changes presently with the coming of the Aquarius with this constellation that brings an age of spirituality, an age of fraternity, an age of universality. We need to do a quantum leap from this materialistic era in which we are in order to cross over to the Aquarian age. It requires the most advanced, the most developed beings in order to become role models for that new Aquarian age. Now we're going to listen to a short extract from Master Omra Mikhail Ivanov that explains what is the Universal White Brotherhood and what is the meaning of universality. Stay tuned, we'll be back. Amen. Voilà, pour la première fois, la Fraternité Blanche Universelle, parce que le mot universel et le mot fraternité sont les mots les plus significatifs. Fraternité, ça veut dire de reconnaître que nous tous nous sommes des frères et des sœurs, et que nous avons le même père et la même mère, la nature. Et alors pourquoi se massacrer, pourquoi se détester Quand on est frère et sœur, on s'aime, on s'aime, on s'entraide, on a la confiance, on a beaucoup d'amour. Alors c'est ça qui manque justement. C'est pourquoi la Fraternité Blanche Universelle vient maintenant dans ce siècle, vers la fin de ce siècle, et pour changer les opinions, les, les points de vue, les visions du monde. Et le mot universel aussi, ça parle, il ne faut plus diviser les choses. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire maintenant le universel Pour vous faire comprendre, moi j'aime toujours me servir avec des images très simples pour que même les enfants puissent comprendre. Maintenant, supposez maintenant que je vous pose la question... Où êtes-vous Très mais au bon fin. Et où se trouve bon fin Oh, ben la Fréjus. Et où est Fréjus Où se trouve Fréjus Oh, ben dans le Var. Et, et le Var, alors où est Qu'est-ce qu'il fait le Var Dans quel endroit Oh, ben il est en France. Ah, et la France, alors où est se trouve la France Oh, ben en Europe. Et l'Europe, alors où se trouve elle eh, eh, Sur la Terre. Et la Terre, où se trouve elle? elle est dans le système solaire. Et le système solaire, ainsi de suite, on va loin. Alors, nous sommes dans l'universalité. Nous vivons dans l'univers. Pourquoi les humains maintenant divisent les choses, les séparent, les rapetissent Pourquoi Pour se casser la tête. Il faut aller maintenant vers le côté universel. C'est ça qui sauvera l'humanité. Et on n'est pas habitué. Tout ça là pour la séparation, le mien, le mien, le mien, le mien, il se tue. Alors, et comment faire maintenant pour arriver jusqu'à là Et il y a, il y a des méthodes, il y a des moyens. Rappelez-vous maintenant, quand je vous ai parlé de, de l'organisme humain. Parce que je disais, que les humains tâchent toujours de résoudre les problèmes, de réfléchir, de, de, de découvrir, mais de ne jamais s'arrêter sur ce que l'intelligence cosmique a construit, ce que l'intelligence cosmique a fabriqué, a créé, des choses palpables, des choses visibles qui sont en nous-mêmes, qui sont autour de nous-mêmes, mais on ne s'arrête pas sur ces choses. Et c'est là que l'intelligence cosmique a tout résolu et elle nous conseille comment nous pouvons résoudre les problèmes. Et je vous ai parlé de l'organisme humain. 
Et voilà comment l'intelligence cosmique, si vous voulez, le Seigneur, si vous voulez, le bon Dieu. Voilà. Alors, comment il a fabriqué l'être humain ben, Il y en a tellement d'organes, il y a tellement de cellules. Tout d'abord, il y a les atomes, les électrons, après il y a les cellules, après il y a les organes, après il y a le corps physique, hein, tout entier. Donc, et il fait partie de l'univers, parce que si l'univers n'absorbe pas, ne reçoit pas, ne se nourrit pas, ne respire pas, ne mange pas, toutes ces énergies, toutes ces forces, tous ces éléments qui sont dans l'univers, dans la nature, dans le cosmos, ça, ils meurent. Alors donc, il y a donc une relation, il y a une communion, il y a une osmose, et c'est comme ça que la vie continue. Alors, si on étudie maintenant bien, bien, bien l'état humain, on comprendra que les organes qui possèdent des cellules, ce sont les pays voilà, dans le monde. Les pays et les cellules, c'est les habitants. Donc, chaque organe est différent. Sa couleur, sa fonction, sa mission, son activité, tous sont différents. On ne peut pas maintenant vouloir les changer, leur couleur, la race jaune, la race blanche, la race noire. Et, mais ce qui est remarquable, ce qui est exceptionnel, c'est que tous travaillent ensemble pour quelque chose à côté qui est un centre, qui est un point, qui est quelque chose, une conscience, qui est un esprit, pour qu'il soit bien, qu'il soit en vie, qu'il soit... Tous donc travaillent, ils font des efforts, ils font des sacrifices, des renoncements, pour que l'organisme est vivant. Eh bien, c'est ça, tout est là. Alors, maintenant, si tous les pays au lieu de travailler seulement pour eux-mêmes, de se séparer, de se diviser, de se détester, de se combattre, ils travaillaient exactement comme les organes dans l'organisme. On ne peut pas changer maintenant. Ils sont, les Français restent des Français, les Allemands des Allemands, les, 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 les Africains des Africains, etc. Alors, mais ce qu'ils peuvent faire, c'est d'avoir des relations, d'avoir une attitude, un comportement, d'avoir une fusion, une unité comme les cellules, comme les organes, ils sont ensemble pour sauvegarder la vie de l'organisme. Et comme la vie de l'organisme, c'est une unité, alors ils travaillent pour cette unité. Et on est en vie. Voilà ce qu'il faut que tous les pays puissent comprendre, c'est-à-dire ceux qui dirigent les pays, puissent comprendre cette lumière, cet enseignement, cette splendeur, cette science, cette sagesse. Autrement, tout finira très mal. Et comme ils n'ont pas étudié encore cette science initiatique, ils imitent, ils continuent à travailler comme dans le passé, dans le passé, toujours dans, pour, dans le passé, et alors, ils ne sont pas des modèles, ils ne sont pas des exemples, et il y aura toujours la misère, la guerre et la pauvreté, parce qu'ils ne veulent pas s'instruire. Ils s'instruisent, bien sûr, mais tout ce que la science officielle leur apporte, mais pas la science initiatique. Now, let us talk about who is Omra Mikhail Ivanov. He was born in Bulgaria, 1900, and it was when he was 17 years old that he met Master Peter Dunov, who had just returned from America from completing his medical studies. In 1937, <clears throat> Peter Dunov, realizing the coming of the Second World War, chose his best disciple and sent him to France in order to protect his teaching, and he said, adapt it to the Western world. 
So in less than a year, Mikhail learned French and delivered his first talk in 1938 at Place de la Sorbonne in Paris with the title, The Second Birth. In the following years, he dedicated his life to helping human beings discover themselves, bring methods for their transformation, and he gave over 5,000 discourses that have been recorded, first in shorthand, then on tape, eventually as uh, videos, and they have made up so far 55 books translated into 45 languages. His teaching and methods are so much for contemporary living. We know that in the past, golden ages have come because they adapted a solar civilization. And again, the teaching of Amra Mikhail Ivanov focuses on that solar model that is actually the model of our own structure. In 1959, he decided to go to India on a one-year journey. In a temple, he met three mystic beings who gave him the honorific title of Om Ram. Om Ram stands for Salvi and Coagula. It is a process of the alchemists. It is the ability of transmutation. It is also on that same journey in India that he met the great Babaji. When he returned to friends, the disciples who met him at the train station in Paris noticed the change that took place in him and decided to call him master. He himself never asked to be called a master. It was on the insistence of his disciple that he agreed to let them call him master. We all know that if we want to excel at a sport, that we choose a good coach. And same if we play a musical instrument, if we want to excel, we choose a good tutor, a good teacher. And this should be the same for the spiritual life. There are so many obstacles and pitfalls in the invisible world that if we are not guided by someone who knows the, the way, then we risk some t challenges and obstacles. And, um, and, and once you choose a coach or a teacher, you don't keep changing, going from one to another just to verify if the methods match, because then you get so confused that, that the coaches or the methods by the teachers are different. It's the same with the spiritual life. And so I invite you to look further into what is a spiritual master through that little book uh, called What is a Spiritual Master that we will show to you later on. There are also some very clear criteria on how to discern true masters. Well, true masters know about the cosmic moral laws. They obey them. They are aware of them. Their life exemplifies these principles and laws. Also, they have a very disinterested nature. They have solved all their personal problems. They are there to help the development of human beings. And the third criteria is they are a perfect example of what they teach. So if you meet such a person, follow such a person because they are a living example of true masters. Now let us cover about the age of Aquarius. You know that Jesus came with the Pison age and that's why there are so many stories of fishes into the Bible. Now the age of Aquarius is like we could compare it to spring at the moment. It's like it's not totally in winter. It's not totally spring yet. We are kind of in between. Well, that's where we're at with Aquarius. It's not totally here, 
but we're feeling its influence. And you notice that for the past 20 years, how much technology has moved forward. Well, um, and we're only entering now into Aquarius. It, it, each of the constellations have an influence of 2,164 years. So it will bring a lot of changes. And as we've mentioned before, it will be an age of spirituality, an age of collectivity, an age of fraternity, an age of universality. It was André Malraux, a French statement and author, who said that the 21st century will be mystic or it shall not be at all. So it's, it's a tremendous statement. It means that if we don't move from materialism, we risk the destruction of humanity. So it's important we recognize the opportunity that we have now as we are doing a quantum leap into Aquarius to adapt ourselves to the currents that it brings, the energy that it brings. In the uh, first book of the Aquarian team, in the chapter of evolution and involution, I mentioned that we are shifting from a 110 volt to a 550 volt now. That's what I call the quantum leap. We have to really embrace what the future brings for our development, for our quickening, for our evolution. It carries some tremendous energies, and we have to be up to the task by accepting to transform ourselves. That's what Aquarius wants of us. It wants us to work on ourselves rather than on the exterior part of us. And that's why in the books of Amram Mikhail Ivanov, you have so many methods of transforming yourself. In the old days with the monks, the nuns, the hermits, they wanted to reach up to nirvana. It was their triangle looking up. They wanted to become one with God, which was fine. They were looking after the salvation of their own soul, which was fine but it never brought the golden age on earth. Now we need to reverse this triangle. We have to bring heaven on earth. We have to bring all the splendors of the soul and the spirit into our own behavior, into our own body. And for this, we require some methods. As we have mentioned that the solar civilizations of the past were modeled on the solar system. And what better model can we get from the sun through its light, its warmth, its life? This is how we are structured too. We have the intellect, uh, the thinking, the wisdom, and we have the heart, the feelings, the love, and then we have life represented by the willpower actions. So because we are modeled on the sun, why not take those and work on this model in order for the soul and the spirit to shine through us? There's a table that Master Omra Mikhail Ivanov illustrates our structure on, and this is so relevant. It explains clearly our lower self or personality, as he called it, or our higher self or individuality. In the lower self part of us, we have the physical body, we have the uh, emotional body, and we have the mental body represented, as I just meant, by action, feelings, and thinking, the intellect, the heart, and the will. In the higher self, we have the causal body, the buddhic body, the atmic body. In the causal body, we find a higher reason. Into the buddhic body, we find the soul. And in the atmic body, we find the spirit. So in the causal body, it's also where we find all the world of prototypes. Every invention that has come forward has come from the causal body. This is also where artists of the past, our master artists like Michelangelo or our great musicians have taken their inspiration from. 
from the causal world and then into the buddhic world which is the level of the soul that's where we find the impersonal love the universal love and into the atmic body where we find the presence and the power of god in the spirit so amra mikhail ivanov was very clear to explain that most people live at the level of the personality the personality is like an actor on the scene it plays its role but it's not its true nature on the scene they might kill each other as actors but after the play they go and have a drink together so you see we are like actors on the scenes of our life it is not our true self we play roles but these roles are often for the satisfaction of the lower self the personality only knows how to pull the blanket its way it always wants to be right it always wants to put down others in order to elevate itself but it's not its true role its true role is to be a servant all it has acquired over the eons of time through incarnations after incarnations has given it a very strong substance so it's not a matter of killing it or negating it it's a matter of using it for the good of the higher self to come down it's like the tree it needs some strong roots you cannot kill the roots hoping to just have fruit no it doesn't work like that so the personality in us represents the roots of the tree and we have to let the fruit of the spirit of the soul be available it means that our personality needs to become the servant to be able to make itself available with all the riches it has accumulated through these eons of times the fear the sensuality the greed all these that have developed over time by ignorance or needs by necessity for survival now they have to be at the service of our higher self and then we will be whole beings another aspect that is very important in the teaching of amra mikhail ivanov is purity purity as the foundation for allowing the the beauty of the invisible world of the divine world to shine through us he compares it to a crystal if a crystal is handled often eventually it will not be able to reflect the seven colors or even the oil lamp in the old days they had to clean the oil lamp every day because the soot accumulated and it, it would not be useful for anything so just like us we have to work with purity we have to cleanse ourselves purify ourselves dedicate ourselves and this is in in our food in the, what we drink in what we watch in what we read in what we listen to choosing purity so that the light can shine through us otherwise we are subject to other influences and these lower influences they keep us in the lower astral level how many times people are stuck in the astral level they say they want to evolve they say they want to be part of of those new currents that are coming but they keep nourishing habits and behavior that keep them prisoner of the astral world one more reason to have a good teacher a good master to help us see through the blurs of the astral world another element to take into consideration and that is very well recommended in the teaching is to nourish a high ideal what is a high ideal maybe to become as perfect as the celestial father maybe to work for the golden age so the earth becomes a garden of paradise so by nourishing a high ideal we then are like the pearl diver who goes into the deep sea to fetch the best pearls he remains connected through a cable so that if if he gets in trouble those on the uh, boat above will pull pull him up out of troubles 
Same with us. If we nourish a high ideal, we link with the vibrations, the the emanations, uh, the life of this high ideal. And should we get into troubles, into temptation, then the higher beings connected with the high ideal will lift us up out of trouble to invite us to be careful. So the high ideal is another method that is recommended. And then there's also that every activity we do in life can be a starting point to invite the divine world to come and work through us. I take just the example of sweeping the floor. Why not ask the divine beings to come and sweep all the impurities in us when we sweep the floor? Or if we wash the dishes or wash the windows, to ask for angels to come and wash the impurities into our heart so that we we, we make our heart purer and clearer. And same if we do some gardening, when we pull weeds, why not ask the angels, the divine beings, to come and pull all the weeds of, of our vices or bad habits and replace those weeds by seeds of the qualities and virtues that the Lord has deposited in our own garden. So you see, from where we are, we don't have to escape the world anymore. It, it Initiations are into everyday life. We can initiate ourselves by inviting spirit to come and dwell in us, to come and take the place of the personality that will always find ways to waste time or waste thoughts or feelings into negative grooves. Why not create new grooves for ourselves so that the divine world comes more and more to visit us, to connect us with our own higher self, and so that we become uh, role models that we become our true selves, our higher selves, so that the earth becomes a garden of paradise. To work for the kingdom of God or for the golden age is not to work for a religion or to work for a country. It's to work for a state of consciousness. We have to integrate in our mind, in our heart, in our action, this new uh, beings that we are in our higher self. And then the earth will become a garden of paradise. It's such a beautiful invitation. And Aquarius is here bringing us the impetus, the currents that invite us to transform ourselves. There are many more methods uh, through the teaching of Amram Mikhail Ivanov that we can find to improve our everyday life every aspect of our life, so that we can truly say we are lucky to live at the present epoch, to be able to transform ourselves so quickly with, with such beautiful methods and the right currents that are inviting us forward. So I invite you to read volume 11 of the Complete Works, which is the key to solve the problems of existence. Uh, we've talked about some of these keys today, some of these methods. We will be covering more in our episodes coming up. Um, and then volume 12, The Cosmic Moral Law. It's important. You will find so much more than what I could describe here in this episode. And then there's volume 25 and 26, A New Dawn, Society and Politics and the Light of Initiatic Science. You will read some fantastic chapters in there on how communism and materialism is, is, is there within us. It's knowing what to keep for ourselves and what to offer to others. Um, and then there's that, that little blue book, What is a Spiritual Master, that I encourage you reading. And we will now listen to another extract from Master Omram Mikhail Ivanov. Alors maintenant, en parlant de la personnalité et de l'individualité, où je peux vous montrer maintenant, 
même, même, même ce qui gouverne le monde entier, par quel mobile il se dirige. Tellement c'est clair pour moi, et ce n'est jamais clair ni pour eux ni pour vous. Tout le monde trouve c'est normal, c'est naturel, on doit agir comme ça. Tout ce qui dirige l'humanité, et ils ne savent pas qu'ils sont poussés, ils sont conseillés, ils sont dirigés par les mobiles de la personnalité. Et comme la personnalité n'a pas la science initiatique, n'a pas la sagesse, n'a pas le désintéressement, n'a pas la grandeur, la noblesse, hein, elle ne sait pas faire des sacrifices, des renoncements, elle tire la couverture, elle veut toujours avoir tout pour elle, elle veut dominer, gouverner. Mais j'ai déjà expliqué qu'est-ce que c'est la personnalité dans mes conférences. Et maintenant, prenez par exemple seulement, seulement une petite image ouais. pour obtenir maintenant une jeune fille qui vous plaît beaucoup pour pouvoir la croquer, pour pouvoir la, la, la manger, pour pouvoir enfin la, la déguster. Et comment on agit ben, Bien sûr, il faut caresser la personnalité. Il faut la cajoler, il faut la complimenter, il faut lui dire, tu es ceci, tu es cela. Ah, je n'ai jamais vu une fille comme vous. Vous êtes la plus jolie, la plus belle. Ah, depuis que je vous ai vu, j'ai perdu la tête. Et que je vous aimerai pendant l'éternité. Pensez-vous, l'éternité. Qu'est-ce que c'est l'éternité Et la fille, qui n'a que la personnalité développée, elle croit, elle marche, elle aime, elle est merveille, elle, 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 elle lui donne tout. Et après, bien sûr, qu'elle s'arrache les cheveux, ça s'est entendu, ça. Mais, et pourquoi alors on arrive à toucher la personnalité hein? Et dites maintenant quelque chose contre quelqu'un qui a des faiblesses, qui a des défauts, qui n'a pas bien agi, mais vous verrez ce qui vous arrivera. Hein? Et c'est ça la personnalité. Et moi aussi je l'ai. Si vous croyez que je n'ai pas une personnalité, seulement comme j'ai compris ces manigances depuis longtemps, 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 oh là 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 là, là des manigances. Et alors, pour pouvoir, la, pas la sagir, ça on n'arrivera pas à la sagir, la dominer, oui, la maîtriser, oui. Mais elle restera toujours comme ça, stupide, bête, ignorante, méchante, ainsi de suite. Mais comme elle a, elle, a, elle a toutes les forces, toutes les énergies, toute la nourriture est là, elle a les clés du buffet, bien alors elle est, elle est très riche, elle est très importante, donc il faut savoir comment manipuler avec elle. Et alors il n'y a qu'en développant l'individualité, en pensant à elle, en se concentrant sur elle, en l'encourageant, la nourrissant, hein, pour qu'elle devienne puissante, c'est elle qui commence à maîtriser, dominer la personnalité. Mais nous ne pouvons pas, nous, parce que nous sommes entre les deux. Il n'y a que l'individualité. Elle a les pouvoirs, elle a la lumière, elle a les méthodes, elle a les moyens, elle a les rayons. Elle peut donc... Et comment maintenant ben, Ça veut dire que quand on vient vous faire des compliments, ah, il ne faut pas perdre la tête. So thank you for being with us and we'll see you on the next episode and farewell and happy living. If you've enjoyed this episode, stay tuned for the upcoming episodes. Here is a preview of what is still to come. Initiatic science teaches us that the food prepared in the divine laboratories with incredible wisdom contains magical elements capable of preserving or restoring physical, psychological, or psychic health. By effectively using human thought, we can draw subtle, luminous particles from food. Yes, by considering food a love letter from God, we set into motion a process of alchemy. It will be a fascinating talk by Alex in episode two titled The Yoga of Nutrition, Conscious Eating to Nourish All Physical and Subtle Bodies.
In episode three, some key points will be shared in the transformation of oneself. You will learn how working with sun and light can ignite your sacred fire and allow you to increase your inner light. In episode four, we will hear from two experts from Brazil about mothers to be. Carla and Laura will share how women and especially pregnant women hold the key to bringing higher souls into our world. In episode five, we will have guest speakers who will share their experiences about collectivity's powers and benefits. They will also describe what the school of Omram Mikhail Ivanhoff is. Finally, at the end of our first series in episode six, Anatole will share with us his interviews of a range of people from Africa, Asia, Europe, North and South America, and Oceania. And they will share with us their experience of the teaching in their everyday life. The testimonials will particularly emphasize the benefits of visiting spiritual centers. And we will not end there. We have other topics to cover, and I'm sure you'll find them very interesting. Here is just a short peek. Love and sexuality, reincarnation, the four sacred sciences, sacred geometry, expressing co-creation through the arts, and much, much more. Before I say until next time, do visit our YouTube channel at Omram. See you soon.